You're listening to Archaeopolitics, a Harry Potter reread podcast focusing on politics in the wizarding world. I am Adri, your host, recovering English major and person surrounded by chihuahuas. <laughs> your natural state. <laughs> As God intended. <laughs> Exactly. Yes. Well, I'm Helene, your co-host, producer, and uh, current ashamed resident of Minneapolis, uh, Minnesota. Yeah. Mm. I, I I don't know what to say to that except to like, uh, yeah. Yeah. I heard the news and I was like, Minnesota again? Really? Brooklyn Center is like 15 minutes from me. It's just- It's not as close- it's not as close as the George Floyd um, incident because that was like less than a mile from me, but maybe maybe like two miles. But yeah, this one is like literally fifteen minutes north of where I live, so that that's where the the news happened this time. So it's just like why my, why here all the time, all the and like Philando Castile, I think is how you mm-hmm. say his name. Mm-hmm. Yep, that was in Minnesota. That was back in 2016. That was where I lived too. I mean, it's just sometimes you also have to wonder: is it always Minnesota, or is it that the reporting is so good out of you know those types of incidents in Minnesota? Because we know this happens nationwide. That's true. That's true. I guess all the big stories just come out of Minnesota. Maybe maybe it is because we're better at reporting it i guess i don't know i mean i'm just saying this happens nationwide police brutality just racist bullshit and we'll talk about this much more in detail later but today let's let's get let's bring you back to uh, harry potter for a bit and then we can uh, deep dive into today's news and today's politic which is something we are talking about chapter 31 O.W. Alice of Harry Potter and the Order of the Phoenix. This is the one where the trio and the rest of the fifth year students take their O.W.L. exams, only to have their astronomy exam interrupted by Umbridge and a group of Aurors attacking Hagrid and McGonagall on the grounds. And Harry ends up having a vision of Sirius being attacked by Voldemort in the Department of Histories, right smack dab in the middle of his History of Magic exam. <sighs> Jam-packed chapter. Filled with a lot of exams and then a twist and another twist. Yes. All seems, all yeah. hope seems to have leached out of this chapter. But in, in things that bring me hope, this is also the place where we have to thank our patrons for making it possible to uh, keep this little baby podcast afloat. And if you, like our lovely patrons, would like to keep us afloat, um, I believe I have said that they are the door keeping Jack and Rose afloat. Jack and Rose being the podcast. Because of my version, they never let go. (laughs) (laughs) So, So we can pay for everything that we need to pay for to keep this show going. You can head on over to patreon.com slash archaeopolitics. And not only do you get to support the podcast, you also get some really cool rewards. Yeah, so $2 a month is going to get you access to bonus content for every episode. And the $5 and $10 a month tiers are going to get you physical rewards every three months if you become a patron. Plus, access to our super secret patron-only Facebook group. Heck yeah, love that place. Yeah, speaking of bonus content and all those goodies... We've got a special patron-only extra bonus segment tonight, uh, tonight, today, wherever you're listening to this podcast. And we (laughs) are talking about part one of two of our deep dive into the different Wizarding World schools and discussing how the cultures of the countries where each school is located might play a part in what we know about them or, you know, what we may think about them in our headcanon. Yes, I did, learned a lot during this research. And there were, not surprisingly, a lot of uh, connections to be made from what is written on about the schools 
on wizardingworld.com and where these schools might happen to be located. So can't wait, can't wait to dive into that. But for now, it is time for our Potter Watch segment where we're going to discuss some of the latest news in the United States. All right, Helene, we've got a continuation of a theme here on Potter Watch. Why don't you uh, kick us off? All right. So so I believe it was Sunday afternoon or evening. A 20-year-old boy, really, um, by the name of Dante Wright was shot and killed by a police officer in his car. So yes, 20, 20 year old Dante Wright was shot and killed in his car by a police officer in Brooklyn, Minnesota. It's just another horrible, horrible tragedy. He was, there are lots of different versions of all these stories going around, but the one that I am most familiar with is that he was pulled over for having air fresheners in his rearview mirror. After pulling him over, the police officers did like looked him up and saw there was a warrant out for his arrest. I believe it had something to do with him. He he pled guilty to smoking a joint when he was like eighteen, and was charged a fine for pleading guilty, which he was on a payment plan for. And be, because of the pandemic, he was behind on his payments for this fine, which led to the warrant being out for his arrest. So that was why there was a warrant out for his arrest, because he was behind on payments for this fine for smoking a joint when he was in high school and pleading guilty to it during a pandemic, not being able to pay these fines. Let's keep that in mind. So he was pulled over. They brought he was out. He was the body cam footage is is released if you want to watch it. I mean, it's it's hard, obviously. He was out of his car. They were about to put handcuffs on him. He decided to evade the handcuffing, tried to get back in his car. And the police officer, who was a 26 year veteran in the police force, who was also tr- happened to be training another cop that day, yelled, Taser, Taser, I'm going to tase you, pulled out her gun, and instead of tasing him, shot him once, which ended up killing him. And that's the gist of it. The police officer obviously says that it was an accident. She meant to use her taser, not her gun, which... I have thoughts on how that's pretty much bullshit. And it's just an it's a it's a fatal awful incident that should never have happened for many many reasons. This was a 20-year-old boy. He had called his mother right before. I think they were on their way to like a housewarming party for someone in his family, I believe. He was with his girlfriend in his in his car. It was like a new car that his mom had just got him, I believe, or just gave just gave to him. And um, I just can't believe that this keeps happening. Yeah, th- this is this just keeps highlighting the reality that you know black folks in America experience every day. Uh, you know. The police have too much power and immunity. You know, they're basically untouchable uh, in terms of prosecution. And, you know, and I'll talk a little bit more about it later when we talk about the politic. But (sighs) this is just so fucking tired of police brutality and, and just... Systemic racism, period. So to give people perspective, when I heard this story at first, my first thought was, how can you confuse a taser with a gun? The tasers I've ever heard of don't even have triggers. They have like the buttons on the side. 
I picture, you know, like I'm a big Veronica Mars fan and she has a taser in that show. And that in that show, uh-huh. you see her taser many times. And it's one of those tasers that has the two buttons on the side. And uh, mm-hmm. there's definitely no trigger. But and then as the week went on and I learned more, I realized I learned that the police regulation tasers are like these like big, chunky, bright yellow with some black accenting gun shaped things that are like definitely bigger than a normal gun size wise that do have a trigger but the difference is let's see tasers weigh about eight ounces less than a pound a gun a handgun the one that she used to shoot him it's about two and a half almost three pounds there is a significant weight difference in your hand difference number two the gun goes on your dominant side. So if you're right-handed, it goes on your right side. Left-handed, it goes on your left side. Tasers always go on the non-dominant side. So when you're reaching for a taser, you should know that you're not reaching in the same place that you're reaching for a gun. Mm-hmm. And then I learned this also today. The type of gun that she had uh, is, is a Glock. It has a safety trigger mechanism where you actually have to pull the trigger once and then pull it back a second time for it to shoot so there's like a double mechanism and it's actually very difficult to pull the trigger back all the way for an actual shot to be fired on the kind of gun that she had uh tasers don't have that so it's very obvious when you're doing a trigger mechanism in by itself there's a huge difference in it Oh, well, yeah, I mean, the and the tasers are bright yellow, like I mentioned. So yeah. the tasers are bright yellow. The gun is black. Uh, the taser is less than a pound. Guns are almost three pounds. Just the weight in your hand. And the trigger is going to feel 100% different. And so, A, if you can't tell those differences, whether you're in a high-stress situation or not, how are you on the police force for 26 years? And B, if you are so panicked in a high-stress situation, that you can't that those differences just completely lose leave your mind because it's a high stress situation you should not be a police officer there is a no way that you should ever confuse those two things well uh, you know and so moving also moving the argument forward it's not like i i also i also have a lot of feelings about tasers anyway and their u- yeah. utility. So, like, I question the utility of guns and tasers yeah. by the hands of police. There are a lot of countries in which, you know, the police do not have guns, tasers, or anything. Well, yeah, I, I like mean, that. if we think about it, a white man in this situation probably wouldn't have even been in this, be, been put in the situation to have been tasered in the first place. First, yeah. first of all, yes. But like, what I'm saying is like. Let's think about, like, the fact that they're equipped with both things, like a taser and a gun, and let's ask ourselves, wait, but why? Like, is is someone running away trying to get into their car a threat, really? And I know they'll say, like, oh, we didn't know if he had a gun in his car or whatever, but, like, it's not like a white man, like, they would have thought that either, even though, you know, white men killed a lot of people with guns um in mass shootings but like okay like if there's just to me like this thing with like how officers or the police force is equipped with military grade equipment is very concerning yeah the graphic that i've seen and shared on social media that kind of describes all those differences as well also said neither a gun nor a taser should even need to be used during a routine traffic stop no, like why? So it doesn't matter. Yeah, like it's just not necessary. It doesn't matter whether whether she picked up the wrong weapon. Why was there even a need for a weapon in the first place? Well, there 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 have also been cases in which like people have sustained major injuries or you know, I think even died from police use yeah. of tasers because they don't the tasers even are know a torture device. That's le- what they are. Yeah, like they they don't even know when to stop. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, they're dangerous. Um, They're made for torture as well as, you know, disarming and stunning. Um, But used in the wrong capacity can be fatal. Um, And it's just, it's just, I mean, 
I agree, police probably shouldn't even have guns to begin with. Well, I mean, I, 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 and I heard this from like someone I know, and they were talking about this like this was like a quaint story, and it, to me, it isn't. Like, police went to like do a demo at a school. They like they asked for a teacher to volunteer to be tasered in front of the students. <laughs> And this teacher did it and thought it was hilarious, you know? And I was like, no, <laughs> what is happening? Yeah. Yeah. So so, so what, what it's doing, in essence, it's, it's making it acceptable for kids to see police using force and not think it's like a quote unquote bad thing. You know what I'm saying? Right. Yeah. Because they did it to the teacher in front of the students. And it was like. Yeah fun or whatever yeah no definitely awful moving from the news in the united states for a second we have some personal news for feline to share with our listeners yes so i announced last week that i got a new job um i start that job on monday the 19th And so I'm going to be taking the next couple of weeks off um, from the podcast just so I can get acquainted with my new job and get adjusted to the schedule and things like that. So we are going to have guest guest co-hosts with Adri here for at least two weeks. We'll see. (laughs) And... (laughs) No, you guys. She's no, quitting on I'm me. Sure, That's what's happening. I'm sure after two weeks, I will feel very ready to come back. But I just, you know, keeping it open. So for the at least for the next two weeks, we're gonna have some um, <laughs> some co-hosts that are gonna be joining Adri. So just keep an eye out for that. Next week is going to be my dear friend Rex. Uh, he's going to be co-hosting with Adri on episode uh, five thirty two, and then after that, we're gonna have. Our dear friend Ario back on the pod from uh, formerly from Speak VC. I think she's she, so excited. Yes, and uh, co-host of Alohomora, as as well as Rex. Rex is also co-host of Speak VC and Alohomora, and uh, we'll have some new voices here to share their opinions on these upcoming chapters. So stay tuned. I can't wait. Yes, it's going to be a lot so of excited. fun. I can't wait to listen. Also, also, I already miss you, even though I'm recording with you right now. I already miss you. Aw, I miss you too. <laughs> Bullshit. Anyway, you're going to be in your fancy new job forgetting all about little old me. Oh, that's not, that's not going to happen. Well, you know, don't worry. I'm persistent. I won't let you forget. <laughs> I'm so annoying. You can't. <laughs> Anyhow, let's transition as well as we can into... Our segment known as Hogwarts Debate Club, where we each talk about the politic we chose for this chapter. And this time we chose the same politic, not only because it fits so seamlessly, but because it's such an important politic. We thought, let's not dilute it. Let's not try to have two dif- different conversations about, about it. It's too important. So Helene, drum roll, please. What is the politic today? The politic for this week, chapter 31 of Order of the Phoenix, OWLs, is police brutality. Yeah. Which is it just like happened the to work that way. <laughs> it just happened to work out that way. Uh, so fun story. Uh, maybe not so fun, but interesting story. I uh, decided to do my notes a little early this week because I knew I was going to have to run an errand on Tuesday night, when it, which is when I usually write my notes for these and read the chapter. So I did my, read the chapter and did my notes on Sunday afternoon instead, read through the chapter, found a politic, was like, this is awesome. This politic fits perfectly. It's something that, you know, we really should be talking about was police brutality. Then I wake up Monday, hear the news about Dante Wright. And I was like, oh, that's what our Potter watch is going to be. And I already picked my politic of police brutality. So, so yeah, it was kind of like a perfect storm, I guess. Of uh, It's like a very, like, prescient theme yes. in our news, in our world. Yes. And um, I know that this is getting a lot of coverage. And I think this has a 
you know, this has a lot to do with how accessible, like, communicate, like, technology has made communication and media. Yeah. But, of course, this has been happening for fucking ever. Yeah. All right. So, but before we get into, like, the whole, like, politics of police brutality in this chapter and how we see it, we thought it was really important for us to give, like, a brief history or primer on policing itself. Okay, so the first thing that we need to know when we're talking about uh, policing is that in the United States, a black person is about three times as likely to be killed by police as a white person. That's right. Three times as likely. And guess what? Black people, way less than white people in terms of like percentage wise. That statistic comes to us from the mapping. Probably too. Correct. (laughs) That statistic comes to us from the Mapping Police Violence Project. Official data on the shootings isn't available for many jurisdictions. There are lots of theories about the reasons behind police killings, including new data linking police uh, unionization (laughs) with police violence. (laughs) I don't know how to read anymore. Okay. Now, the role of police unions in this is that data shows that the police's disproportionate use of force is associated with the fact that that it is hard to prosecute officers for wrongful killings. And one possible reason for that is police unions. Fun, but not fun. Note, when an officer is fired for a wrongful killing, they still get their pension, Helene. That doesn't surprise me, and, unfortunately. And for that, we have unions to thank for. A big issue of, you know, the reason, a big reason why these things, I believe, keep on happening is because there are no real consequences set up for police officers who do these types of things. And therefore, they don't, I mean, if there were severe consequences an established set of severe consequences that they can expect to happen if they do kill someone out in the field, um, whether that person is guilty of a crime or not, and most likely that person is going to be black, then they will probably be less, I would say, quote unquote, incentivized to be so callous about taking lives in the field. Yes. And you are correct in that. That's what it, you know, that's what they're saying. Like the excessive use of force in the police is because it's so hard to prosecute them because of the rules that unions have implemented with, you know, the powers that be. So you have like a lot of unchecked power going into this. So including their pensions being untouchable. Yeah. So you can't even like a family can't even sue for wrongful death, you know, for wrongful death in a civil case. But so so I wanted to get like that stat right off the bat before we went back to way back in the day. The origins of anything that we now could recognize as policing can be traced back to Sparta. And, you know, we're talking about like the 300 days (laughs) of Sparta And that army's primary focus was to keep the slaves from uprising. That's right. It wasn't to defend Sparta against its enemies. No, it was to keep the slaves in their place. That also happened in Rome. And guess what? That also happened in the colonial United States. And and also in in, uh, Egypt. Oh, correct. So I, I just wanted to do like the a, Jews were slaves. like I just yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I I I wanted to do like a way back before Egypt, and then like take it, bring it to the United States. Yeah, that is a valid point. Okay. So in the South, some of the primary policing institutions there were the slave patrols, tasked with chasing down runaway and preventing slave revolts, just like 
in Sparta. The first formal slave patrol had been created in the Carolina colonies in 1704. And during the Civil War, the military became the primary form of law enforcement in the South. During the Reconstruction, many local sheriffs functioned in a way analogous to the earlier slave patrols, enforcing segregation and the disenfranchisement of freed slaves. So any fucking time you see a Confederate flag, flash back to those words. That's why it's so hateful. Now, it's not, it wasn't all, you know, it wasn't all about slaves. In the North, it was about money. Businessmen were paying out of their own pockets to prevent theft from their businesses and keep their interests safe, i.e., you know, hoard all the money and do terrible things to get that money, but not, you know, face any consequences for their actions. Those businessmen convinced the government to establish police that were paid by the taxpayers for the good of everyone, supposedly. So now, not only were they rich, but they didn't have to pay for their own police protection. And in the North, this was driven by people who were not, cons- you know, they, they were um, worried about people who they, the people in the North, did not consider white at the time, but are considered white now, which is like wild. Um, these immigrants yeah, like were Italians Catholic. Italians and Irishmen and... Yeah. yeah, there were Catholic, Irish, Italian, German, and Eastern European immigrants, okay? They looked and acted differently from the people who had dominated the, the northern cities before, like Boston. And there was like a call for preservation of law and order. Does that sound familiar to any of you? I am the law and order president. So yeah, so like, even though we're talking about these things that happened in the 18th century... And we are now on the 21st century in the in these United States of America. Not much has changed. No, it has not. So let's get to our politic today, Helene. You, you know, you were the one who chose police brutality because you did your notes before me. And then when I heard the politic, I was like, I, I don't think I can like pull focus away from that because it's too important. So yeah. talk to us about that. Yeah, so when I, as mentioned, when I chose this politic, I didn't really know about the climate of what the, you know, news was going to look like right now, um, today. But uh, yeah, I I chose police brutality originally because of that one scene in this chapter where they're taking their astronomy OWL exam, and it's like, you know, midnight, past midnight, and Harry looks up. After, you know, actually he looks down, he's looking at his telescope and he looks down and sees Umbridge with a pack of six, I think, oars behind her uh, on their way to Hagrid's cabin in the middle of the night and presumably on her way to fire him from his job. Not sure why you need six oars, six wizard cops with you to fire someone from their job in the middle of the night. But... You know, we, we, see, we, we see like a scuffle, we see them go in, something happens, and then they come out and all these auras are shooting like tons of stunning spells at Hagrid. And since he's a half giant, nothing's happening. He's not falling. Um, he's getting increasingly angrier, not surprisingly, because these people are shooting spells at him for a reason that, at least to the reader, is unknown Um you know, maybe he resisted being it fired. Just, I'm not. It just seems <laughs> disproportionate. Like, oh, he was putting nifflers in my office, presumably. I am going to bring ours to his house in the middle of a fucking night and try to like take him there, like that. Like, what? Yeah. It, it. Well, I mean, it just doesn't make any sense when you sit back and kind of think about it. Um, reading this chapter as an adult, like knowing how law enforcement works, knowing how things work. It's like, why would someone bring a group of six cops to that, to someone's personal residence, knowing that you're going to fire him? It's not like she was arresting him for like, what would she be arresting him for? (laughs) Also let's, let's be real. This is not a normal firing hour. 
No. Like yeah. this is not during the school day. This is not um, during the course of his normal duties as a teacher yeah. or, and, you know, and groundskeeper. Ha- yeah, Harry notes that he, Harry notes that he, um, that she, that Umbridge probably made that decision to do it at this weird hour because she didn't want to, like, cause another scene like she did with Trelawney. Still not a good excuse. But who knows what happened? We, we as readers obviously do not know what happened to escalate the situation to having a bunch of people attacking him um, with spells after presumably just trying to fire him. Um, I'm sure he said, I won't go quietly. I'm, I don't know if they were trying to take him to Azkaban and he was like, no, I'm going to go meet up with my buddy Albus and I'm not going to tell you where he is. Well, and also let's be clear, he spent some time in Azkaban in chamber. prisoner. No, wait, in chamber. Yeah. Sorry, not in prisoner. <laughs> Duh. Uh and in chamber. So he has like quite the PTSD. Yeah. And then of course, during this like showering of spells being shot at him, his dog, Fang, is um hit with a stunning spell. He's out. McGonagall comes and is um, rightly outraged as to why they are doing it this way comes to his defense and gets hit with four stunning spells at the same time from cops uh, oars and uh, gets completely knocked unconscious and obviously all the kids in the astronomy exam just witness this um, and see everything that's happening obviously can't focus on their and it's exam. like 15 minutes is what I understand from like the uh, like this whole scene that we see through Harry, yeah, which is seems a little short in like the description, right? Yeah, but by the end of the scene, the proctor or the professor is like, "Well, you got six minutes." But when he first started, they had like sixteen minutes or twenty. Yeah, something like that. it was a long time. Um, yeah, it was a it was yeah. a good chunk of time where they were just sitting watching this happen. And so I read this and I was like, you know, this whole situation really seems reminiscent to me of the situation that happened with Breonna Taylor last year, where police did uh, a no-knock warrant Mm -hmm. um, and entered her house in the middle of the night and started shooting the apartment up and to the point where she was hit with a bullet in her bed while she was, you know, sleeping. Um, and it's very, very reminiscent of what's happening in this. This chapter is reminiscent of that because they come into his house in the middle of the night and just start shooting spells at him. And thank God he's a half giant or he might have been, you know, had a fate similar to what happened to Brianna. Um, so, yeah. And then I also thought the fact that him being half giant was kind of, so the metaphor of Hagrid being half giant, especially when it comes to Umbridge, is obviously a metaphor for being biracial. Uh, or can we can we unpack that a little bit though? Yeah, because one of the things that I and while I do not uh, disagree that this is definitely police brutality, one of the things that I take a little bit of. Um, I won't say issue, but I find a little bit problematic is the depiction of Hagrid as being less susceptible to stunning spells because of his uh, half giant self. And and the reason that I bring this up is because um, the medical community as, uh, and also the the police um, institutions, medical and police institutions and even the law, have often ignored the plight of Black people, uh, uh, specifically Black Americans, because they believe that they can withstand more pain, that their their self-reported levels of pain are not the same as like the pain that they're experiencing, either physically or emotionally. Isn't it also because they see them as less human? as well exactly yes so so th- yeah. that so the um origins of this mode of thinking as a lot of it you know does traces back to slavery where like 
gynecology as a form of medicine was birthed, um, sorry for the pun, out of, um, (laughs) (laughs) sorry, that was a terrible pun and I didn't mean to make it, out of uh, medical experiments with slaves, with women slaves. And as they were experimenting with um, these women slaves and kind of figuring out the, the anatomy of the a woman's body, obviously they didn't do this experimentation in any ethical way. And they also brought a lot of pain and suffering to a lot of Black women. And this experimentation has not stopped. Birth control pills were, you know, were given to um, unknowing Black women, um, including in Puerto Rico, to, quote unquote, like, lighten lighten up the population. They didn't know they were taking birth control pills. So basically, like, rendering people not fertile for the amount of time that they were. Yeah. Yeah. For the the amount of time that they were, you know, experimenting on these women and also performing um, and performing like hysterectomies on poor women and women who were incarcerated for any reason so that they could not have any more children. And most of these women, they didn't know what happened to them. Yeah. They didn't know that anything. They didn't know what was done to them. Yeah. So the depiction of. Um, a metaphor, like a, a, a character who is a metaphor for biracial character of origin. color, like an other. Yes, yes, and having that that character depicted as obviously less than human, but also not susceptible to pain or attack, I guess, or more resilient, right? Like more resilient in the face of an attack. Yes, uh, it's just kind of perpetuating that false narrative that black people feel less pain uh, than white people and therefore can withstand more hardships, more physical things than white people and therefore are, you know, used for these types of experimentation. It's, it's, it's fucking sucks. The whole metaphor is just a big jumbled, awful piece of crap narrative that they come and a, a group of six wizard cops come and attack this metaphorical biracial character In the middle of the night, they shoot his dog. Thankfully, it was. Thankfully, there's stunning spells in the wizarding world, and these are not fatal gunshots. They're not shooting Avada. Could you imagine? Could you imagine they're like shooting Avada Kedavra? It's like, oh, I meant to like stun him. Yeah, they accidentally say the wrong spell. They say Avada Kedavra instead of Expelliarmus or you know whatever it is, stupefy. Yeah, they're stupefy. It just sounds know. the same. It, it just sounds the same, you know? Yeah. Like, um, I don't know what to tell you, man. Like, it's a high-pressure situation. Exactly, right. Yeah, and then McGonagall coming to his aid and, and being caught in the crossfire, so to say. So, yeah, that's the politic. That's why I picked it for this chapter. Uh, it just happened to really... F- I was just, just like a very light politic. I know yeah. we, in this, in this podcast, we are usually very deep and thoughtful but this is such a light politic today you guys i don't even know that was sarcasm if you are not such a just a barrel of fun just happened (laughs) to fit just so so perfectly into what's happening uh in the world today and not in a bad way i look forward to a day where it's not (laughs) fitting right because that could that could be said about any point in our history where like cops are abusing their power and using systemic racism to like kill black people and people of color more than they do white people. So I honestly look forward to a day where this is not a fitting politic. Me too. <laughs> Speaking yeah. of that, oh gosh, I have like my heart hurts. Let's go to like the quote hour moment that you chose when thinking about this politic, Helene. So yeah, my quote or mine was a moment this week. It was McGonagall coming down to help Hagrid and stating that Hagrid hadn't done anything to warrant them attacking him, only to be met with being shot by four stunning spells at once, knocking her completely unconscious and leaving people 
who know her and the the like amount of magic that she had to withstand uh seriously concerned for her health i mean like talk about excessive use of force right oh my god yeah four like not one or two four stunning spells her like her way like traveling her way and we know she's a fierce witch who can do amazing magic so the auras were probably like shit you know like this is the most powerful witch in the castle right now but like that's not that's not an excuse like her no her proficiency is not a threat on your lack of proficiency or imagination and i feel like that is something that a lot of people need to hear especially men because why are men and that is that is my soapbox moment (laughs) <laughs> yeah um insert patriarchy jingle here uh that's a buffer in the vampire slayer <laughs> podcast reference um what is the quarter moment in this chapter that uh you know replace brutality man well um i also chose a moment but i chose a moment where i saw police brutality of a different sort um and i'll, I'll explain it after i talk about the moment the moment that i saw was when Harry realized that he was doing so much better at his OWL potion exam because Snape wasn't in the room and so was Neville. And the reason I chose this, and I know everyone's like, but Adri, legitimately, that is school, not police. Yes, I know. (laughs) Snape is not an or, but guess what, you guys? He is someone in a position of power just like the police. And the way that he treats his students is very much policing his students. He is not teaching his students. He's not encouraging his students. He is policing them and showing favoritism to certain kinds of students. We all know that Hermione Granger is the shit, but how many times (laughs) have we seen him sneer at Hermione Granger and like basically kiss Draco on top of his head and going like good boy and like Draco's like yeah. not that great like if I were gonna be like grade what I was just gonna say he so he resents Hermione for be- knowing the stuff that he wants his his students to know yeah but again like she like he doesn't lash out as much to Hermione as he does with Neville and Harry. But that is because Hermione works like 20 times as hard and still gets some lashing out. So even like a woman of color is getting policed by Snape, even though she's done nothing fucking wrong. I agree. I 100% agree. She is, he he is abusing his, his uh, power uh, in a very police-like way. For sure. Well, and he knows he's basically got immunity in terms of employment. Yeah. Because, you know, Dumbledore needs him. Yes. Like, in that way, Snape being a double agent is his own union, you know? Right. He can't get fired, but if he did get fired, he'd probably get his pension. (laughs) That little bitch. Anyway, (laughs) for you, who is the character who, like embodied this politic tonight so i picked the one named or in this chapter (laughs) (laughs) so Um, the cop is the cop that was named yes (laughs) i mean like if i could have just i mean i could have just picked like the six ors but they do name one of them um dollish is one of the ors dollish and the rest of the ors (laughs) yes so i picked i picked him because he has a name um but really they're all awful and I didn't technically count Umbridge because she, I don't, I, I don't know if she had, did she partake in the stunning spell? I don't know. She, I just counted the the people that were, you know, mind, mindlessly, blindly following her orders and attacking people for God knows why. Ah, these ministry hats. <laughs> right. <laughs> so my character actually was Umbridge. <laughs> I, I was like, Umbridge is like, Umbridge is a cop full stop like if i ever saw a cop that's umbridge like umbridge has the mentality of a cop yeah i mean she kind of reminds me of trump honestly like like wants to be wants to have the glory and like power of a cop but doesn't want to do the work 
that re- it requires to be a cop. And like that is the most insidious part of it, right? Like right. to to have all the power but none of the responsibility or get your hands dirty. Like that is such an insidious type of person. Yeah. Umbridge is a cop, full stop. Yep. That's that's it. Yeah, sure. <laughs> It's pretty awful. So I couldn't think of like super great examples for police brutality throughout the book. But the first one that did come to mind was um, the beginning of this book where um, Mm -hmm. the legislative branch is being manipulated to frame and convict Harry um, of a crime that he did not commit. Oh, for sure. That is. (laughs) <laughs> For sure, that is police brutality or abuse of power. Yes. And also, uh, the, you know, that reminds me, Helene, of this moment Hermione looks at Harry and goes like, do you think she's really going to wait for proof before yeah. firing Hag- Hagrid? Like, this is not yeah. how it works. And legitimately, that set chills down my spine because that's exactly what happens in these cases of police brutality. It's act first yeah. And then maybe see if you can scrounge up enough evidence to retrofit your actions yeah. to to exonerate you. Yep. So, I mean, <laughs> that was the first – it was the first uh, thing I could think of that happened in the book where people in law enforcement were abusing their position of power to get what they want. So, yeah. What about you? Throughout the book. In addition, I mean, in addition to all the lovely points that you've made, I thought also like her insistence of making up new rules for Hogwarts to police the corridors, yeah. her making a student led police force basically with Oh, yeah, the inquisitorial squad. Yeah. Yeah. And just, just like the presence that the the oppressive presence of Umbridge in the castle with all her rules regulations and giving Filch like free reign to commit like acts of brutality to the students that to me is like like this book this entire book is like cops gonna cop cops gone wild also let's rethink the way that we police institutions <laughs> and the way that we allow systemic racism to still prop up these institutions. Maybe it all needs to be rethought because these foundations that we built our institutions in are like have the blood of a lot of people. Totally. Well, <sighs> on to. Uh, Onto like terrible things. Speaking of blood and terrible things. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) Shifting our focus to our Dementors and Chocolate segments. Uh, What's your Ted Cruz today? Yes. My my daily Ted Cruz is uh, the implied use of performance enhancing drugs and Ron and Harry's eagerness to use them. It's just, it kind of hit me different this time reading this chapter. Um, I feel like every time we read a new chapter and like we are, you know, a little older, a little wiser, (laughs) sometimes not wiser, but just older, it just hits you a little bit different. Yeah. Like, oh, I thought it was like kind of a funny, like, oh, haha, like there's like magical things that can help people perform better on tests and like Harry and Ron want to use Magic Adderall. Right. Magic Adderall or... (laughs) All this stuff, and uh, yeah, I mean, those things are are can be dangerous. They're illegal for well, some of them are illegal or not prescribed to everybody for a reason. Um, and it was just kind of felt like it made light of that. And uh, we see our hero, the like the heroes of the series, wanting to use them and like go trying to use them and only their only Hermione stops them from doing that. The voice of perpetual reason, Miss Hermione Granger. Right. <laughs> also they're under a lot of pressure, not just emotionally, because you know, Harry's like, so I'm having like uh visions of Voldemort still. Uh but also because yeah. of the OWLs really define the career path they they'll be able to take in the future. And I get it. Yes, like that's yeah. a lot of pressure, but like kids 
this is why we need mental health at Hogwarts. <laughs> McGonagall exactly. can't solve yeah. everything. She's too busy. <laughs> oh, okay. What about you? What was your Ted Cruz? So my Ted Cruz was the use of a stunning spell on Fang, comma, a dog, period. How dare you? Exclamation point. Which kind of also like fits with like this reality. See, like the first time I read this, I it's not that I didn't care. It's more like, oh, that fucking sucks. But like now that I am more informed and also the mother of three <laughs> more little dragons. More informed dog owner. Slash, no, well, I didn't have the, the three little dragons I have now. Slash dogs. Mm. <laughs> I'm just like, wait a second, bitches. Like, this actually happens IRL too. Like, cops shoot a ton of fucking dogs mm. and kill them. Yeah. When they're trying to, like, enter houses or even if they're called in an emergency to a house. So, no, this is not cool, you guys. Not cool. Yeah, poor puppy. It just hit me differently. And it hit me, like, in a very, like, visceral way. Yeah, pups. It's awful. Well, on to happier things. But, Try to you know, get our minds off of. We've talked about our Ted Cruces. Yeah, don't want, we don't want to think about dead dogs anymore. So, we're going to move on to chocolate. And, um. Yay, chocolate. Also something that can kill dogs, by the way. But, like, let's oh my move gosh. On. <laughs> oh my gosh, you had to go there. Why did you have to go there? Uh, <laughs> because I am an informed dog owner. <laughs> yes. Let's think about the good parts of chocolate, not the bad parts of chocolate. Uh, so my chocolate, that the thing that I held dear in this chapter was uh, Hermione in uh, during the scene of their astronomy exam, when they're watching everything go down with Hagrid, I really liked Hermione like she just completely forgot about her exam so she and started to pay so she could pay attention to what happened with Hagrid and what uh, what was going on down there because she actually does care more about the people in her life than her schoolwork like it's always a big joke that her mighty's like oh school is so much better it's oh we could be killed or worse expelled you know like the the iconic Hermione priorities thing and it's obvious that her priorities from book 1 to book five have shifted and she now cares more about Hagrid and his well-being than her than a literal exam which exams are arguably one of the most important things to Hermione except for the people in her life so we get to see her priority shift there and I really like that oh well in that vein though um my heart grew like 10 sizes which is not a lot because like my heart's really tiny <laughs> When <laughs> when McGonagall just came to Hagrid's like aid so like immediately, just like N- what are you doing? Like, and you know she suffers yeah. from it, but like that's real bravery to like care about the oh, people yeah. in your life enough to put your own life at risk. And she has like yeah. privilege in this moment because she is, you know. A powerful witch, a respected witch in the community. And she's using her body as a shield for Hagrid, basically. Yeah. So she's the head of house of Gryffindor House for a reason. She's one of the bravest people in the series, that's for sure. Also, one of the sassiest, which like chef's kiss. Like true. Sassy and brave. Not so much in this chapter. All I want to be. But all I want to be in my life is to be known for being sassy and brave. So like this tracks. Exactly. Anyhow, it's time for us to talk about the responses we got from last week's question. Because every week we ask our listeners a question. Last week we asked our listeners if Hagrid should have taken Grop away from his fellow giants. What was the response, Aline? We got a few answers. Lopez.desiree.m on Instagram said, I want to think that Hagrid understands giant culture more than others and made the right call. Well, Desiree. Oh, shout out to Desiree. Desiree and I went to college together. Oh, cool. Well, (laughs) Desiree. Side note. uh, Well, Desiree, I I want to think that too. But unfortunately, I (laughs) I don't think that is technically true. I want to think that. 
I'm with you there. Yeah. But we want to give Hagrid the benefit of the doubt. But then on this most recent reread, we were like, oh. Wow. Yeah. I mean, where would he have learned this giant culture? I mean, he might have like researched it, studied it, but he has never lived it. So. Well, he learned it from the wizarding world, which has a definite view on giants. That is not, I don't think, the way that giants themselves would describe themselves. Yeah. So, like, he couldn't, he didn't have the chance to learn it from his mother because his mother died, or his mother left his father when he was a baby and went back to the giant camp. So he didn't even know his mother and she wouldn't have been get, given him the chance. She's the only person in his life that would have actually been able to teach him that. He could have maybe tr- learned it secondhand from his father, but his father, he would be learning it from a lens. Like his father would be teaching it to him from a lens of a wizard learning it from a giant teaching it to a half giant. It, it, it's well, very diluted at that point if he's learning it from his father. I, well, same thing though. I, I will interject that as... So Hagrid, had his mother stayed in his life, Hagrid would probably still have um, grown up in the wizarding world. So he would have still gotten a diluted perspective on giant culture because you can only get a full um, understanding when you live in that culture. If you live in a different culture, like you can hear about it all you want and learn about it, but you won't really know, you know, like understand it in the same way as living it. Um, One example that I use is like my cousins who grew up in the mainland and their understanding of Puerto Rican culture is far, far away from the actual Puerto Rican culture. And the more time that I spend living here in San Antonio, Texas, the less that (laughs) I understand about current Puerto Rican culture, right? Like I may be able Mm -hmm. to talk about how it was for me for the 24 years that I lived in the island but that doesn't mean that I am current in my understanding of how Puerto Rican culture has moved in certain directions because I don't live right. there anymore. Yeah. And I'm looking at it from a different lens too and perspective. So you're right about perspective and dilution. I just wanted to um, complicate it a little bit more. No. Yeah, no, it's, um, it's true. So I want to think as well, Desiree, that he understands it more than others and made the right call, but Unfortunately, we just don't have the the facts. Well, to back you up. know, at, at the end of the day, we know that Hagrid thinks he's doing what is best for Grop. So I don't think that we were questioning Hagrid's motives. No, and his intentions because we not know at his all. motives yeah. are pure. Yes, but it's really about like motives aside. Was it a good idea? Right. Well, Katya um, on our Facebook. Uh, Patreon only group said in response to the question, uh, do we think Hagrid uh, should have taken Grop away from his fellow giants? Katya said, absolutely not. Grop is not going to be happy trying to fit into the wizarding world and is a danger to everything in the forest. Yeah. So like Grop has an actual environmental impact on the forbidden forest. Exactly. Yeah. Just ripping out trees left and right. And then our final answer was from xx.acyyp.xx on Instagram. They said, I'd hope Grop had a say in leaving. Otherwise, it's taking him away from all he knows. And sadly, I don't think Grop had a say in leaving because he definitely protested it as far as we what we hear from Hagrid. So he, had, he is indeed yeah. taking him away from all he knows, which was the issue that we discussed on last week's episode. If you haven't listened to it yet, go back and listen to it. It was a very interesting one to record as well. I mean, we are not really shying away from anything recently. <laughs> no. I mean, that's what the show's here for. Talk about the hard topics. I know. All right. So for today's episode, this week's question is, what justification would Umbridge give to bring Aurors to Hagrid's to fire him and i'm doing air quotes here in the middle of the night yeah so we're gonna post that question on all of our social media outlets uh the sunday after the episode releases so please feel free to comment on those posts or send us an email or call us or 
yell into the distance and hope we hear it, but don't do that last one if you actually want us to put it on the podcast next week, because we're probably not going to hear it that way. Uh, but yeah, anytime you reply to our weekly question, we will read your answer on the podcast next week. So stay tuned. Hearing from our listeners is legitimately one of my favorite things. Same. It's it's amazing. I love it. By the way, guys, you can also leave us a voicemail with your answer to this question. Call this number. It is a a voicemail only number, so no one's going to pick up. It is 915-996-1699. And if you just don't want to answer our question but also want to like say something to us, you can also do it that way. Like that's totally fine. Yeah, and that way we can play your beautiful voices on the podcast rather than just reading your answers in our own voices that you already probably just are so sick of at this point. Like, no one wants to hear my nasally voice the entire fucking time. Let's hear your voice, too. (laughs) Exactly. On that note, let's transition to the media that we've been consuming. I have not looked forward to a media we've been consuming more than today. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> oh, well, then tell me all about it. What is the media? I have watched, guys, the pilot for a fantastic new HBO Max series. It is called The Nevers. It is set in Victorian England, and it has sciency steampunk vibes, which, like, if pressed, I will admit to liking. But if you know me in the real world, never divulge this to anyone it has some paranormal elements to it which is very like spooky or whatever people have they call it the touched people with like significant abilities that seem to come out of nowhere it's full of feminism and it has parasols that are weapons what's (laughs) that to like so like Hagrid's umbrella which is an umbrella, but also a weapon because it's a wand. Yes, but like ladies carrying parasols that are weapons. That's pretty cool. And like badass, like ladies helping other ladies, finding all these other people so that they can like create a good community because they are, by the way, being persecuted. All right. It's pretty wow. good. It's pretty good. What about you? Well, I right before we recorded this, I watched the most recent episode of This Is Us. And I thought that would be okay. interesting. I, I wanted to bring that up because they are really, really getting into it with like some really deep race stuff. Um, they're having, uh, and in the show, in case you aren't familiar with it, it's a show about three siblings, two uh, biological brother and sister, twins, and one adopted black brother. That was a that was born and adopted on the same day. So there are triplets, but one is an one is adopted and he is black and his name is Randall. And they're really getting into rant they're diving in and exploring Randall's experiences growing up as a as a the only black person in his all white family. And mm-hmm. his experiences of microaggressions from people in his life, including his family, and how he felt growing up not fully being accepted in any way and they in this episode specifically of the, that I watched this week the new one they really really dig deep into his relationship with his brother Kevin who is white and it's just it's just really really honest raw deep racial discussions that need to be taking place right now in the public eye and I'm just really happy that they're bringing this to light because it's I'm it's something I'm sure many many black people in America and probably all over the world experience and never really get a chance to be represented in popular culture and media to kind of bring awareness so I I really really enjoyed that storyline on top of that I've also been watching Grace and Frankie I am already in season 5 Of that show. Jesus. (laughs) I know. I know. I started like what? Like a week and a half ago. I don't even know. But I'm already in season five. And I just got to say, love the um, positive, you know, women, representation of women in their 70s and 80s. Love that older women representation. Also, the sex positivity. Absolutely great. And um, I just wanted to say, 
I took a personality quiz to figure out which Grace and Frankie character I am. And I got Saul, which I am not even remotely surprised about now that I thought about it. I thought I was going to get Frankie because I am a very much, I do love Frankie quite a bit. But when I got Saul, I was like, yeah, that tracks. That really, really tracks. (laughs) I need to take this personality quiz because it's, in my mind, it's either going to be Grace or Brianna. I was just going to say I can totally see Brianna. Go ahead. Just every time June Diane Raphael, like, as Brianna says something, I just look at Seth and I go, I don't know. I, I don't know how they do this, but this is me. <laughs> but blonde and white and skinny. <laughs> I just love, I got to, the, there was an episode that I watched recently where she like sneaks over to the beach house when she knows that Grace and Frankie are going to be gone on a girl's trip um, with like a bunch of movies about dogs dying. And she's like, I came here to have my one annual cry. I cry. I give myself one day a year to cry and human deaths don't do it for me. So I have to watch movies about dogs. I just just loved it. I was like, oh my God, girl, one annual cry. But like that level of emotional repression (laughs) is very me. Like I can't, I I can't like even like her relationship with her boyfriend is very like, yeah, yeah, I'm just like, I'm like, is this me and Seth? If Brianna was a little bit more emotionally available and a little bit less commitment phobic, legitimately the same person. (laughs) Well, with that, that's it for today's episode. You can join us next week, sans Helene, because she's abandoning us for a couple of weeks. But, you know, I'm happy that she gets to focus on her new job. Um, And... uh, a guest and I will be talking about chapter 32, which is titled Out of the Fire of Harry Potter and the Order of the Phoenix. And as you know, if you've enjoyed this conversation, we would love for you to take a second to give us a five star rating on Apple Podcasts or wherever you're listening to this podcast right now. Uh, it helps new listeners discover the podcast. And uh, we want to gain uh, our army of politic listeners and uh, get more listeners. So go leave us a review, please. Thank you. Also, we love external validation over here at Occupolitics. So that's also a reason to do it. Yes. But the more people that find our podcast because of the five star views, the more people to give us that will be around to give us external validation. So it's all just a big circle. (laughs) Yeah, no, for sure. Like this, this is what I'm here for. Until then, politics managed. Support this show by going to patreon.com slash Occupolitics. Our patrons keep this show going. You can find us online at Occupolitics.com and we are at Occupolitics on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. You can email us your thoughts at info at Occupolitics.com. Leave us a voicemail at 915-996-1699. And you might just hear yourself on the podcast. Adriana Wilson is the founder and creative director of the podcast. Helene Karp is the producer and social media manager. Allison Pullman is the audio wizard and editor who makes us sound so good. Cover art and physical rewards are designed by Adriana Wilson. The views expressed by the hosts and guests are expressly their own and not representative of their employers or associates. Occupolitics is part of the MuggleNet family of podcasts.